Welcome to this guided tour of Colic Railway Yards, Colic Shed, known to those who work there as the Loco, and the Derbyshire extension of the Great Northern Railway, which Colic was built to serve. The photographs and plans that make up this presentation are from the archive of transport historian and author Hayden Reed. They are just a few of perhaps a thousand such images assembled during decades of research that went into his two books on the subject. Through the middle of the 19th century, the Midland Railway held a near monopoly of railway lines in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. Other railways, wanting to uh, transport goods on the Midland lines, had to pay premium rates. Pit headstocks became a common sight as the landscape and local economy underwent significant change. This is Bestwood Colliery, seen before the First World War. At this time, coal was big business. In the Midlands, the rock strata dipped to the east and coal seams reached the surface at the border of the two counties. Collieries abounded and much of the coal went to London. This 1870s map of the area has collieries shown as well as the railways. The darker line running east to west is the Derbyshire extension of the Great Northern Railway. It's this line that we will look at. Dissatisfied at paying high rates to move coal, the Great Northern decided to build its own line into the coal field. In 1872, it placed a bill before Parliament in a bid to break the Midlands monopoly. The new railway would start to the east of Nottingham, leaving the company's branch from Grantham, loop around the city, head west through Derby and on to the outskirts of Burton-on-Trent. At the eastern end of the line, it was planned to build a triangular junction in an area near to the village of Colic. This low-lying land by the River Trent comprised gravel pits and farmland. The new line was built by thousands of navvies using pick and shovel. In the early 1870s, the invention of a reliable steam shovel was still two decades away. The route west was not easy. It required long gradients of up to one in a hundred, several tunnels and a number of large viaducts. In Derby, many properties had to be demolished. The longest tunnel, not just on the line, but in the whole of the East Midlands, was built at Mapperley. The 1,132 yard long tunnel took the line 200 feet below Mapperley Plains. Coal traffic started in 1875. In February the next year, passenger trains began running to stations at Gedling, Daybrook and Baseford, and from August to Pinkston. In 1878, services were extended to Derby. Trains left Nottingham from the company's station on London Road, which still exists today as a gym and health club. Passenger trains finished here 80 years ago. In 1876, a complex of sidings and loco sheds opened at the eastern end of the line named Colic after the nearest settlement. Housing built for workers became the railway village of Netherfield. Through the 19th century, new branches were added, feeding more traffic to Colic. The Nottingham Suburban Railway was one, joining at Daybrook and serving several brickworks. These developments continued into the 20th century, when Gedling Colliery started production in 1903. Navvies are seen here building lines at the colliery. The new century marked a change in passenger services. Arrival of the Great Central Line and Victoria Station saw passenger trains for Derby divert to the new shorter route, missing out Gedling and Daybrook. Only local trains to Baseford, like this one seen at Gedling, now ran along the eastern end of the Derbyshire extension. It took on a character of its own and enginemen named it the Backline. 
1923, the Great Northern Railway became part of the LNER. The colourful apple green livery was now reserved for just express passenger engines, and most of Colic's fleet were painted black. In 1948, the railways were nationalised, creating British Railways to address spiralling losses. Colic and the Derbyshire Extension became part of the new Eastern Region. This Class K2 is at Baseford in 1950. Nationalisation didn't solve the economic problems, so a major reorganisation took place in 1950. The western half of the Derbyshire Extension was transferred to the London Midland Region to save money. The plan failed to take into account that the Midland Region was run by ex-Midland Railway men that saw the ex-Great Northern Line as a rival, taking traffic from their own lines. The Midland Region had its own freight yard at Toton and traffic was dwindling. Control of the western half of the Derbyshire Extension created opportunity to divert coal traffic to Toton. When collieries refused to transfer traffic to Toton, another tactic was needed. In 1958, boundary changes gave the Midland region Mapley Tunnel. Midland engineers declared it unsafe and in 1960 closed it. Coal trains continued to travel the two miles from Gedling Colliery to Colic, but freight from further west had to take a diversion through Nottingham, Victoria and arrive at Colic facing the wrong way. Trains had to reverse into the yard and this made handling inefficient, difficult and even dangerous. This runaway occurred in 1965. Before 1960, trains approached downhill, so this could never happen. Traffic progressively drained away and the yards became increasingly empty. By the time this 1969 view was recorded, steam had gone and large areas of sidings were out of use. In April 1970, the yards and loco sheds closed. British Rail wasted no time in levelling the site and removing the tracks. What had been one of the largest freight yards in Europe is now just a memory. Traffic from the entire district came to Colic. Wagons were made into trains destined for locations across the country. As traffic grew, so did the yards. At its peak, Colic could handle 6,000 wagons a day. Although Colic was built for coal, a tremendous variety of other materials and products were routed through the yard. We will now look at some of these. Ironstone from the Vale of Beaver was an important traffic, second only to coal. Generally originating from Denton, trains travelled to Stanton Ironworks near Ilkeston. This empty is passing Baseford. Oil trains were regular users of the line, transporting imported oil from Ellesmere Port on the Mersey to the oil storage tanks on Colicky Strait. This train is passing Arno Vale in 1958. Grain traffic from East Anglia worked into Colic, often destined for the brewing industry at Burton-on-Trent. This train of mixed vehicles has just passed beneath Arnold Road near Baseford. Sugar beet was another seasonal crop into Colic, this time destined for the processing plant on Colic Estate, where this photograph is taken. Raw beet was cooked and pressed to produce sugar. The pulp byproduct from sugar beet production was also shipped by rail from Colic west to Burton on Trent for animal feed. The pulp was often warm with steam coming off the open wagons. 
Another steaming material carried by the Derby extension was manure. This wagon ticket is for a movement, no pun intended, from Burton to Etwall, but similar consignments went through Colic. Bricks came into Colic from the Nottingham Suburban Railway via Daybrook. This is the yard at Thorningwood on the Suburban Line, with brick wagons ready for collection. Beer trains from Burton-on-Trent were a regular feature of the line. This one has turned off the Derbyshire extension at Baseford and is heading for York. Containerised traffic used the line, often being included in express workings to Manchester Deansgate. This up train is about to pass below Hallam's Lane near Arnold. The line here is now a path. Livestock traffic comprised usually either cattle or pigs. This cattle train is at Morley, near Derby. Collet yards had cattle pens to allow animals to be detrained, fed and watered on long journeys. Scrap metal trains came through Collet. Some, like this one seen near Bagthorpe Junction in the mid-1950s, were destined for Stanton Ironworks. Freight trains did not always comprise a single load type. Mixed trains were common in the years before the Beeching Report. This example is heading through Daybrook towards Colic. Not all trains were revenue earning. An engineer's train is seen here at Arnold Vale in the late 1950s, engaged in track renewal. The line would close soon after. Finally, it should be remembered that coal really was king. The line served around two dozen pits, and something like five million tonnes came through colic each year. This loaded train is seen at Daybrook. Colic needed a large workforce. This 1935 view shows shunters, footplate men, and seated on the foreground, inspectors. Shunters carry pole with hooked ends for uncoupling wagons. A similar group posed for the photographer in Great Northern Days. The loco is immaculate compared with the previous photo, and the men wear a more formal attire. The yards at Colic required a large number of signal cabins to control them. Some, like Colic North Junction, were particularly large, with nearly a hundred levers and would be manned continuously. The much smaller box at Colic East Junction controlled access to the Colic Estate Light Railway, which opened just after the First World War. The Colic Estate's Light Railway was privately owned, being built for Sir Ernest Jardine. Unlike a normal railway, it was not fenced in and ran alongside the estate's roads. The Estates Railway outlasted Colic Yard, not closing until March 1985. In its later years, it served a number of petrochemical storage sites. The yards were managed from the Traffic Department office, which is visible beyond the locomotive junction box in this view. Carlton Fields signal box lay at the heart of the yards and is seen in the distance. Empty iron ore wagons are to the right. Colic was not the exclusive preserve of the Great Northern. The London and North Western Railway ran its trains on GN lines under an agreement between the two companies. The LNWR built its own locomotive shed at Colic, and it is seen in the background of this 1959 view of an estate's oil train. By this date, it was sold out of railway use. We have seen how, after 1960, trains had to reverse into the yard following the closure of Mapley Tunnel. Here, a coal train sets back into the yard at Colic North Junction in 1966. In 1968, the National Coal Board took this aerial photograph. The amount of traffic visible is a fraction of what would have been present 10 years earlier. In the same year, the final freight working ran from Burton-on-Trent to Colic. 
guard Pierpoint is seen boarding it at Hawkins Yard. By early 1970, the rundown was virtually complete. The down empties yard is indeed empty, and the South Shunter's cabin has lost its name board. In the following year, the tracks were being lifted and buildings demolished. What had taken decades to create disappeared virtually overnight. The only rail activity to continue was an oil siding at the eastern end of the site, which used part of the old main line connected at Rectory Junction. This too closed in 2019, ending revenue service at Colic. The offices of the locomotive department were built on the old Netherfield Lane, which became Netherfield Lane and later Victoria Road. This view dates from around 1910. The first shed at Colic had four roads and a two-storey erecting shop. This Ivor Class R1 stands outside the old shed, as the engineman called it, in about 1920. In 1889, the shed was greatly expanded, with another 12 road shed built on the other side of the workshop. The, the big shed is seen here, with two sterling saddle tanks outside. Six coupled freight engines, like this sterling goods design, formed the mainstay of Colic's allocation in the late 19th century. In around 1900, the Great Northern built a coaling stage capable of replenishing multiple engines at once from elevated wagons discharging into chutes. Just before the Second World War, the Great Northern's successor, the LNER, modernised the shed and built this 100 foot tall automated coaling tower, nicknamed the Cenotaph. The modernisation included the installation of a set of shear legs, which allowed locomotives to be hoisted and wheel sets dropped out. Another part of the modernisation work was the construction of wet ash pits between a pair of tracks in the loco yard. Chutes from between the rails discharged to the central pit. The pit had wheeled covers to protect it. These were rolled back to allow emptying by a steam powered grab crane, seen here in about 1957. Modernisation also included the addition of a 60 foot vacuum operated turntable to augment the original 45 foot turntable. In LNER years, former Great Central Class 04s were introduced to Colic. In front of one stands Charlie Alvey, George Ward, Frank Swinson, Fred Holloway and Fred Webb. This is in 1946. A curiosity that came to Colic for a period in the 1930s was the Sentinel steam rail car. These were used on local passenger services, this one being pictured at Daybrook. The Second World War brought austerity design freight locomotives to Colic, and they, like the O4s, had a long association with the shed. This example is passing Daybrook in 1957. Locomotives undergoing repair, such as this J6, would often be stored alongside the old shed. The low roofed building behind with the ventilator contained mess rooms. Locomotives required periodic in inspection. This record card is for an ex-GCR Atlantic at Colic in the 1940s. If a loco changed sheds, the record cards would go with it. Boilers were also examined on a monthly basis. Spare freight engines were stored in the summer when coal production was less, explaining why August and September are blank. 
This sweeping view of Colic around 1950 shows the lofty workshop in the background, flanked by engine sheds. Turning slightly to the right, the engine yards in front of the big and the new sheds are dominated by eight coupled freight types, the mainstay of the depot's allocation. In the 1930s, a retired driver named Percy Swinson wrote handbooks of useful information for new drivers. He only charged the cost of the blank notebook, and they were highly prized at the loco. In Great Northern days, employees at Colic banded together to form a mutual aid society, effectively private health insurance, and this is a page from the 1914 accounts. The shed at Colic was off limits to the public except on rare open days. This is one such occasion in 1956, and young visitors examine a J39 in the engine yard. On another occasion in February 1965, members of the Lancaster Railway Circle inspect and record the residents of the big shed, including 0463819. Colic regularly serviced A3 Pacifics in the 1930s and again in the 50s. The last A3 to visit was Flying Scotsman. It spent several days on shed before working a rail tour on the 28th of May 1965. All engines going on to or coming off the shed had to cross the bridge over Emrys Road. Just months before the end of steam in 1966, A Class 8 F passes by, unnoticed by the children below. Engines at the end of their lives, but with serviceable boilers, were sometimes used for steam heating duties. The last surviving K3 is seen in the new shed doing this work in 1965. Invariably, withdrawal from service meant a trip to the breaker's yard. In early 1967, the last of Colic's steam locomotives are stored, awaiting that final journey. The last resident engine in steam at Colic was a standard Class 4, which soldered on performing stationary boiler duties from 1967, when the shed had gone over to diesel. In November 1969, The vast expanse of the 1889 Big Shed is virtually empty, bar a handful of Type 2 diesel electrics. Even these will soon be gone. On the 13th of April 1970, the loco shut its doors for the last time. It did not lie in state for long, and by the end of 1971, demolition was in full swing. Today, all that remains of the loco are relics in private collections, such as these on display in St George's Church during the Tracks in Time event in 2013. Netherfield and Colic Station marked the junction for the start of the Derbyshire Extension. A train from Grantham is seen arriving around 1912. The station opened in 1878, the year that the Great Northern passenger services commenced into Derby. This view of 1958 shows the GN buildings in later life. In Edwardian times, the station was a busy place. The platforms are crowded in this postcard view. Behind the station stands the local landmark of Samuel Bourne's Britannia Mills. Seen from an approaching train in 1957, the station was unusual for the Great Northern, being accessed from a road bridge above. 
The station was notable for having the junction signal box built into a converted waiting room on the platform. A bay window was added to give the signalman a degree of visibility. In 1960-61, the station was completely rebuilt. A new signal box was provided to the west of Charwood Road Overbridge. The station buildings were also renewed in similar style to the signal box. They were modern and efficient, but somewhat austere. By the 1980s, traffic through the station was a shadow of its old self. Coal trains from Gedling to British Selenese ran daily, though, passing Wrong Road through the station to cross over west of the station. The next station to be reached on the Derbyshire extension, after passing Colic, was Gedling and Carlton, latterly just Gedling. It's seen here in March 1953, looking north. After 1900, regular passenger services through here comprised just local trains that ran as far as Baseford. Services to Derby took the shorter route from Nottingham, Victoria. Gedling was a quiet station, as depicted in this Edwardian postcard. It had one siding, which was used for, amongst other things, loading hounds from the nearby South and Hot Knots hunt kennels. Early in 1960, just before closure of the station, this Class 04 stroke 8 drifts through running light engine. From the 4th of April 1960, the line terminated at Gedling Colliery. The gent's toilet is marked by the ventilation mover in the single storey portion of the building. There is a generous allowance of fire buckets visible in this 1960 view. The station is seen from the window of a passing train on Saturday the 2nd of March, the final day of operation. For the next two years, a rail replacement bus service ran from here instead. For another 31 years, coal trains continued to pass the closed station, now repurposed as a youth and community centre. These totem-based Class 20s had a train of loaded 45-tonne merry-go-round hoppers. Yedling Colliery once had its own workman's halt. The simple ash surface platform is visible in this 1952 photograph. An engine is in the head shunt beyond the signal box. Workman's trains were not advertised in the public timetable, but it was possible for the public to use them. They generally comprised worn out old stock and the service lacked any frills whatsoever. After Gedling Colliery Holt, the line passed deep below Mapperley Plains before arriving at the next station at Daybrook. This was situated on Mansfield Road. In around 1914, a train from Shirebrook stands in Daybrook Station. It will not run via Colic but instead will turn down the Nottingham Suburban Railway to reach Nottingham via Trent Lane Junction. The exterior view of Daybrook Station shows its similarity to Gedling. All stations on the line were built to variations of the same basic design. Excursion traffic was a feature of the line. Special trains from the West Midlands passed this way going to the East Coast. This handbell from 1955 is for a train starting at Daybrook. Such an excursion is seen crossing Mansfield Road, heading east. It will run through Colic Yard, passing Carlton Field Box and Rectory Junction before heading to Grantham. Another eastbound train departs, this one bound for Nottingham via Gedling and Netherfield and Colic. Arno Hill Park is visible in the background to the left. The last station we visit is where local services terminated at Baseford and Bulwell. Renamed Baseford North in 1953, it was the junction for connections to the Great Central Main Line to London. An East Coast excursion enters Baseford North in the charge of one of Colic's Class B1s, 
in around 1957. The line crosses Vernon Road in the background. The local has just arrived at the base of North, having run via Gedling. It will now reverse out of the arrival platform and pull forward into the departure platform on the other side of the fence. Baseford was a busy station and served several nearby schools, as attested by this footplate invasion around 1954. It was fortunate there was not an inspector about. The line closed west of Baseford in 1960. Tracks ran back to Daybrook until 1965, serving the goods yard there until 1964, and thereafter being used as wagon storage. This is the scene at Daybrook in 1969. Today the line is just a memory, and this concludes our tour along it. If you would like to learn more, then two volumes on the subject are available from Book Law Publications on Carlton Road. Thank you for watching.